Hello and welcome back to NorCal 715. Today I have an MK subwoofer. It's a big boy. Discover Deep Bass. Miller and Kressel Sound Corporation. It's got a big 12 inch subwoofer. This one is a V 2B subwoofer. Made in USA. It's got the normal inputs and outputs. 1 amp fuse, M and K, V2B. So let's go ahead and remove the amplifier module from it and see what it's going to do. Let's plug it in first and see if it draws any power at all. So I've got it plugged into my Variac, my Syncor PR57 AC Powerite. It is a Variac with an isolation transformer built into it. And I have it in the 175 watt or 1.5 amp range. So it's powered on. I do see a little end rush, which tells me something's going on in there that's still working. But I never get a red LED, and I don't get any audio out of this guy whatsoever. So now we'll go ahead and pull the back plate off, and take a look inside and see what's in there. Alright, so it looks like I got a couple plugs here. Now we can completely set the amplifier separate from the box and get down to business. Alright, so the first thing I see here is a fuse. Let's go ahead and check the fuse on the continuity range. And the fuse is open. Meter's good. Fuse is open. Pop it out. Don't know if you can see it on the camera or not, but it, it is blown. Not a super bad blow. It didn't leave an arc spot inside. And according to this, it is... An AFE 4 amp 250 volt fuse. So let's do some basic checks over here. So I see where the power plug comes in here. There are some connections that are labeled. So I see speaker uh, negative, speaker positive right here, uh, V minus, and V plus. If I measure from V plus to one side of the fuse, I get zero. And then V minus should go over here. Uh, there's a integrated power module, a hybrid power pack chip. So one of these pins on the chip, pin 6, reads continuity to the negative input of the power supply. This is the positive side, goes to the fuse, so let's read from the other side of the fuse. So I read 3 ohms to pin 7, 0 ohms to pin 8, 99 ohms to pin 10. So I'm suspecting a short between pin 7 and pin 8. Pin 7 and 8 I don't believe should be shorted and I think that's going to be our problem right there. So let's go ahead and pull that chip out of there. If you look up in here you can see the uh, hybrid power pack. It's probably an STK type chip. It's only held in with two screws and two nuts and washers. So I'll go ahead and pull those loose. So now the chip should be loose and by looking down in here Maybe kind of hard to see on the camera, but it looks as if there is a Molex plug that the chip actually plugs into. So I'm going to try to pry the chip out of it and see if it will maybe reluctantly want to slide out. And it is moving, so that is good. There it is, an STK086 power amplifier. Let me go see if I can get a data sheet on this and find out what the pins do. First off, before I find a data sheet, let's try to make a determination. Is it the chip that has the short or is it the board? So as I recall, it was pins seven and eight. And I do get three ohms. Let's go to the actual ohm range. 2.9 ohms between pin seven and pin eight. That is definitely a problem. Let me pull the data sheet and we'll see what those pins actually do. Maybe they're supposed to be shorted and maybe we have a different problem somewhere. All right, so here is the data sheet on the STK086. So it shows the STK086, a 70 watt minimum RMS output. STK086, 
maximum supply voltage plus to minus 55 volts storage temperature case temperature and let's see if having the good information here recommended supply voltage plus or minus 42 volts and an 8 ohm load output power 70 watts minimum rms at 0.2 percent harmonic distortion frequency range 10 to 100 thousand hertz input resistance 52k and of course here's what we're looking for right there the schematic diagram so we had a short in between pin 7 which is the output pin and pin 8 which is the positive vcc input so if we look right here pin 7 is the output pin and pin 8 is the positive vcc and pin 6 is the negative vcc input so they supply a positive probably 40 to 50 volts and a negative 40 to 50 volts right here these are the two output transistors that actually drive the speakers. These are the driver transistors and then some pre-drivers and bias back in here. So once again, we'll get the chip, measure from pin 7 to pin 8, and we read 2.9 ohms. So that's telling me this transistor TR9 is shorted collector to emitter. So it looks like we just need to refill this with a new output IC. But before I do that, I'm going to do an ohm meter check on the speaker just to make sure it reads okay and the voice coil is not shorted on it because that'll cause the new chip to fail virtually instantaneously. So I do happen to have a schematic and this is for the uh, M and K VW subwoofer. It's the Volkswoofer subwoofer, but I believe it's extremely similar. So looking here, it looks like we have the uh, power come in to the main power supply transformer. It goes into a full array bridge rectifier. The transformer is center tapped, so that becomes our earth or zero ground point at that point. Positive output goes through F2, which is the fuse that we saw that was blown on the power amplifier board. And then that's our V plus. Negative goes to P6. And then that is V minus. I don't show it right there, V minus. And so it looks like there's a couple other little regulators going on in here. It looks like those may be on the board. Uh, I looked a little closely. I couldn't see any of these transistors. It's a 2N2222 and a 2N2905. Anyhow, they're supplying a plus 12 and a minus 12 reference for some portion of the circuitry. I didn't see that. But I do also have what's labeled as the VW1 Volkswoofer 1B amp module. And so it shows all the pre-amplifier stages in here and all the filtering and uh, low pass filtering going on here. Uh, the inputs and the outputs to the satellite speakers. And then down here it shows two power amplifiers. And I notice on this circuit board, they're only using one of the two sets of pads for amplifiers. So they must have made a different version. And I believe it's the, this one is labeled as the V2B subwoofer. I believe the V1B is labeled at twice the power output. Now they're claiming the V1B has a 400 watt peak output by using two chips. They're claiming the V2B is a 200 watt peak output using two chips, but that's, Obviously not true RMS because the true RMS rating on that chip was 70 watts RMS. So they must be using the IPPILS rating of power amplifiers, which was a very popular thing to do back in the 70s. Uh, I call the IPPILS instantaneous peak power if lightning strikes. It's not a true rating. It's absolute full distortion, 100% what it can deliver. It's going to be a square, very distorted wave output. But nevertheless, it looks like we need a new power amplifier chip. So I'll go ahead and contact my customer and see if he wants to approve this repair. So my customer did indicate to me that he just recently had the uh, woofer reconed or re-surrounded with new edge surround. It does look like it's been redone and the surround's in excellent shape. I don't hear the voice coil uh, scraping on the magnet whatsoever, so it seems like they may have done an adequate job of repairing this. But anyhow, let's go ahead and check the resistance of the speaker and make sure that we're not in the zero to five ohm range that could potentially damage the amplifier. So the inside of this unit is filled with sound deadening material, which is good, especially on a subwoofer. So all we've got coming in here are the three leads for the power supply, the ground, the positive, and the negative, and then the two leads for the speaker leaving. So I'll just go ahead and probe the two speaker leads. And we see 7.6 ohms, which is perfectly fine DC resistance for an 8 ohm speaker. So I'm going to say the speaker's in fine shape. Okay, so I have the replacement STK086 chip, brand spanking new, never been soldered on. So I just want to go ahead and check the integrity of these two output transistors, TR9 and TR10. So I'm just going to go from pin 8 
to pin 7 and I see a junction and then from pin 7 to pin 6 I see another junction and I see both junctions put together there so that tells me both of these transistors are good I do see a junction so let's go ahead put the chip in put a new fuse in and test this unit out and make sure it works okay I'm going to install the chip into the connector down here first then I will slide the insulator into place second alright there it's in place I can see through the screw holes now I'm just going to carefully slide the insulator in between the chip and the heat sink I can actually lift it up just a little bit to get it in there and then we'll tighten the screws up I think it's in there yep I can see it sticking out underneath the corner right here so it's all the way down to the pins so we'll just go ahead and put the screws in now put the washers on them and tighten them up all right, so I have them snug. I'm just going to tighten them down with a little impact. It should be nice and tight now. Insulator's in there. It looks good. And we'll go ahead and put a new fuse in it and fire it up. See what happens. Okay, so I've got it all back together and I'm just getting ready to fire it up. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to ESR these capacitors just to find out if they're okay. So I'm going to short my leads together. Make sure it reads zero, that's good. So here's a couple small caps. I can get to the leads from the top side of the board. Absolutely open. Open. And about 60 to 70 ohms, definitely bad. Now these two big ones up here are 220 microfarads at 50 volts. They should read pretty close to zero. Four ohms, bad. 30 ohms, definitely bad. So the repair just got a little more involved. I'm gonna have to unsolder all of these connections here as well as these connections here because the speaker terminal blocks are riveted in place. They don't come off. So I have to unsolder all of this as well as these connections here. So 10 connections I'm gonna have to unsolder to get this board up and out so I can get to the bottom of it to unsolder these three capacitors here and the two big filter caps. So let's get it up and out of there. All right, I got the board unsoldered. I have the chip unbolted, the LED unsoldered. Now we can lift it up and get to the bottom of it to replace those capacitors. But yeah, there's no way you can get these loose. They are glued in as well as riveted in place. So while I have the board up and I'm waiting for my solder sucker to cool so I can put the small tip back in it, let's look at the build quality of this unit. Look at the quality of the solder, of the pads, all the resistors, all the capacitors. The leads have been folded over and soldered for extra integrity. That's really something you don't see. Normally you just see a quick point-to-point -point solder where they just put the leads through, solder it, and clip the leads off. Every one of these has been folded over and then soldered. Uh, because it's in a subwoofer application, it's going to be subject to a lot of vibration. And so that really makes for a good long life unit. However, unfortunately, you know my opinion on hybrid power packs. I think they're crap. They definitely fail long before they should. Uh, it would have been so much easier for them just to design a circuit with a complimentary push-pull amplifier. Much more robust in my opinion. Easier to repair if the need arises. You can replace individual transistors. But you know what? They build this thing at a price point and not at a quality point. It's interesting that they did not bend the leads over of the IC sockets uh, for the pre-amplifier op amps. But also what's interesting is they did socket these chips so a uh, replacement would be much much easier if you did ever have to replace one so let's go ahead and get these four capacitors right there replaced and this one electrolytic right there replaced <laughs> I got C15 and C17 out and luckily they are labeled positive on both capacitors. Now let's go ahead and unsolder these two small ones and this one small one right here. C14, C2, and C17. Well, no, uh, that one's not labeled. So we'll just unsolder them and we'll go from there. All right, so I've got them all unsoldered. Let's go ahead and pull them out and make sure they labeled the board as to where the positive goes on all of them. 
Okay, good. The positive goes on the right. As you can see, the negative is on the left, so that's good. So the negative is on the right, the positive should be on the left on this one. And it is labeled, very good. Now on this one, the negative is on the top, the positive should be on the bottom. Oh, and they did not label that one. I've just got to make sure I remember the positive goes down. So let's take a little Sharpie and put a little plus down there so I remember which way this one goes in. So let's go ahead and check these out of the circuit. So here's the first one, it's the 10 at 25. The three small ones are all 10 at 25. Uh, that one reads about 35 ohms, definitely bad. Second one is absolutely open. I'm not getting anything on it whatsoever. If I sharp my leads, it's good. Open, and the third one, open. Sharp the leads, good absolutely open. Now for the two large 220s, about 30 ohms, definitely bad. Uh, three and a half ohms, that one's not too terribly bad. I would expect to see uh, between about a half an ohm and zero ohm. So here's the new ones I'm going to go ahead and replace them with, 220 at 50. Let's go ahead and measure that one. Pretty close to about a quarter ohm. Perfect. If I can get the lead to stay on there, good. About a quarter ohm, absolutely perfect. Now here's the tens at 25 replacements that are gonna go in. One and a quarter ohms, perfect. Uh, one and three quarters, that's still fine for a 10. And one and a half ohms, much, much better than the ones that came out. So as you can see, the new capacitors, the 220s, are much smaller in size, but the ESR is so much better. Now the 10 microfarad caps are just about the same size as the old ones that came out, so no difference. Let's go ahead and get those installed, and then we will actually fire this unit up and give it a test. Make sure it works okay. Okay, so in keeping with the way they had the leads originally dressed, I went ahead and folded those down. Folded those down as well right there. Folded those two over. Folded these down. And then folded those over and soldered all of them just as it came from the factory. So now, let's actually go ahead and put it together and give it a try. Okay, so we'll actually go ahead and assemble this now for hopefully the last time. Got the insulator in there really good, so it should be good. All those caps have been replaced, so we should be ready to rock and roll. New fuse in there, ready to go. Let's put it together and see what happens. So we'll plug the connectors on. Heard a little thump, so something had some residual voltage, even though it's been unplugged for days. Okay, so I have the hot plate back in, the amplifier board. Let's switch it on for the first time. And we see the LED does light up at this point. I heard a dull thud. Let's hit play. I hear bass. It's shaking. So I have some YouTube copyright free audio going into this guy. Here we go. Man, it's shaking my video lights. Well, it certainly is working. I certainly hope you enjoyed this video on the repair of the MK subwoofer. If you enjoyed this video, please consider making a donation on my YouTube homepage with the PayPal donate button or at paypal.me slash NorCal715. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and ring that bell to get future notifications. Remember, with your help, we can keep these things out of the landfill and out of the recycle bin. Everybody have a great day. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.